I'm going to talk a bit about um, the whole development of the live modular and I've got a bunch of thoughts about you know playing live and things that I've been talking about sort of vocally in videos for ages but it's nice to just sort of collect it in one place and obviously if you've got questions just shout out and ask um, and if there's time I'll talk about the organization of the case because there's a few sort of conveniences and things that I've been just trying to make my life easier um, and so in terms of my background I'm basically an electronic musician sort of enthusiast who's made electronic music since like 2000 so nearly 20 years um, I just love I don't know you know I don't know how I ever thought I could be good at making electronic music or even if I am still good at making electronic music but it was always interesting to me and you know that I, I sort of got into it at a time where it was getting cheap enough that you could buy studio equipment for not a lot of money so it, it made it possible um, and things have only gotten better now it's like we, we've got the best possible tools that we can possibly hope to have at the cheapest possible price but I also think that you know it's one thing to have the equipment it's another thing to make something good with the equipment um, and something we've been talking about over the last couple of the days uh, is how you know, a lot of the equipment that's designed is quite prescriptive in the sense that, you know, it, the equipment is very powerful, but it requires specific input. It's not, like, it's not been designed in a way where it celebrates the kind of chance, the possibilities of, um, you know, randomness and these kinds of things. We're starting to see designers put those into systems, but they're not the be all and end all and they're not the intrinsic way it's designed. These devices expect you to put in specific melodies and voltages and get specific things out. Um, and the good thing about that is that makes it a powerful tool and you can realize your musical ideas. But if you're like me and you're kind of, you know, I, I can't really play an instrument, I can't play the piano, I can feel like a scale, I can work things out and I can hear things in my head and get it down. But I'm not intuitive. Um, and I work with equipment in a reactive way, um, in the sense, we were talking about this yesterday, about how, you know, I will, I kind of need to hear something and then I can sculpt from that point. And then from that point, then I start to get a vision, but I, only, I have to have something handed to me first. Um, and so my point is that you've got all these devices that are very powerful, but they're not... Um, they don't work in this sort of quite that way. Um, and so I, you know, into lots of electronic music equipment, bought lots of things, bought lots of standalone synths. I've been using computer sequencing since wherever. I never really did a lot of hardware sequencing, if I'm honest. Even though I had hard to, hardware sequencers, I had a Yamaha RM1X and I could totally have done a, you know, sort of dubby analog modular type thing with it, but I never did. I always just used Cubase. And then, so fast forward a few years and, um, you know, I, I basically started becoming aware of the Eurorack modular thing. And to me, what it typifies, you know, as you all will know, is, is this, this idea of creating your perfect machine. It's that it really can be the exact device where you've got things like the ER101, where you can put in very specific melodies and concepts or, you know, what I'm interested in, where I, I want to put in certain ideas and I want control, but I ultimately don't mind giving up my kind of, you know, my control to the machine to some extent. I want to like collaborate. Um, and so I started getting some modular stuff and as, as I'm sure you all find, there's a kind of magic point where you've got enough stuff, you, especially when you add drums and things. For me, one of the, the, the eureka moments was just clocking Rene to some drums. When I suddenly had a Make Noise Rene running and some percussion at the same time. And I was like, oh my God, like this is really fun. Suddenly I could hear that I could make whole tracks on the modular. And I know before that I had kind of always thought I would use it as just a voice, um, but it's t it completely, it, you know, it, it opened a door, um, which I've sort of been following down. Um, and as I've gone and made this live system more complex and, and more detailed, I've kind of thought, I keep coming back to this point that I had like the most fun just jamming like one voice and like some very basic drums. So I kind of believe strongly that you don't need a lot to be able to play live. It, the minimum requirement is not very much. And it's more to do with, you know, you just gelling with the workflow that you've given yourself um, and, and just listening to the results. Um, and we'll, I'll talk more about, you know, thoughts to know that you've actually achieved greatness and how to even work out if what you're doing is successful. Um, 
Yeah, it just comes down to this, this the whole sort of value of live performance, because, you know, as all of you are all electronic musicians, you understand how it's made. And I don't know if you agree with me, but like when I go and see shows and there's no element of risk on stage and that the person is just playing something off of the backing track or that there is a backing track and they've got maybe they're doing some live effects processing. It's just like my heart just I can't get into it. And I'm I'm such a dick because it's just like <laughs> You know, it's still amazing to hear music on a big system. It's totally true, but um, I, I don't know. Because the, the problem is that thought also is it's the same thing as going to see like an amazing piece of, you know, experimental art and saying, well, I could paint that. It's like, well, you didn't, you know, you didn't paint it. And it's sort of, it says, oh, is what makes art good, the, the technical abilities behind making it. And obviously that's not true. Um, so it's just this idea, though, that, um, you know, I played shows with these systems and, and kind of fallen flat because my, my aim was to make an improvisational system where I really wouldn't have anything pre-prepared. And so I could turn up with nothing pre-prepared and play a show, which is the, you know, the ultimate in risk because you can have a bad show, um, but it's also the ultimate kind of rush. And I, I felt the purest ex sort of expression of what electronic music can be. Because you're not, you know, it, it is a risk. And for an audience's perspective, they know that what you're, they're seeing is going to be a completely unique experience. Something that they cannot get off a record because it didn't exist until the very second it's being created in front of their eyes. So it's, it's very like kind of jazz and, and the sort of those styles of music where improvisation is celebrated and, and it's all about the communion of you and the artist experiencing something together because as an artist you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but what I've recognized is, yeah, playing bad shows, you know, I've, you know, there was a really good example at a festival where it seems to be cursed with monitoring to a certain extent, because poor monitoring is such a kiss of death. It's something you maybe don't think about until you go out to the venue. But of course, if you're trying to both invent and mix a record in real time in front of an audience, having really precise monitoring is, is absolutely critical. Um, it's something where you, you kind of leave it to chance and say, oh, I hope that they'll have something. But of course, you can turn up to a venue and they've got like one wedge that's down there. So you've got mono, but you've got stereo outputs down by your foot. Or maybe you will get a pair. I had a thing where I was playing with this show and, and just the whatever for whatever reason, the volume that was outputting from the case was causing the monitors to cut out one by one, where I would lose the right hand monitor and then I saw so I was well I'll listen to the left one and then I would lose the left and then I would lose both and then one would come back and then they both come back. And that continued throughout the show, which is like, you know, the most off putting thing you can possibly do you know, have happen. It's like absolutely like, oh no. Um so, you know, and then the, the guy who followed me was doing a kind of pre-prepared set where he's using an MPC and some synths. Um, and he, he just absolutely slayed it. It was like, it was so brilliant, so fun. People were literally like climbing up on the sort of walls in the, in the dance tent during his set. And, and so it's one of those things. And he could adapt his set and he can extend sections. But this, it, you know, I have a real kind of sort of fight in my mind to, to the, the degree of, do you pre-prepare everything? Do you pre-prepare nothing? The, you know, and, and in an audience's perspective, do they care whether you're, how much risk you're putting yourself in? Because just to make another very practical point, when you go and play a show with this case, I mean, you can't see, you can see it because I've got a projector up here, but if you're an audience, you maybe can't even see all the wires and the stuff and you don't even really, therefore perceive any difference to me if I just had a, you know, a CDJ 1000. So from an audience's perspective, it looks exactly the same and they don't realize what you're doing because you can't explain it necessarily at the start of every set. And I've, I've seen some amazing sets with people who were doing more, you know, um, sort of, um, well, doing stuff behind the scenes, but it would have been pre-prepared. Like a good example of that is DJ Shadow. Like I saw DJ Shadow doing this tour where he played inside this enormous like ball and if any of you saw from this tour where it's like, there's like basically two sort of walls behind him that were projected onto in a ball that he went inside and then it like, it literally like closed up and they would project onto the ball like graphics and stuff and they would project onto the walls behind. And there was stuff like where it would look like a spinning basketball and the background would make it look like it was sort of bouncing on the floor in front of you. And it's like, 
you're listening to this amazing, brilliant, you know, hugely creative music. Um, and, you know, who am I to say? Maybe he is remixing the tracks on the fly as he works, but, you know, I suspect it's a mixture of, it, you know, what I could see is a mixture of DJing and um, playing. But the important point is when he was in that ball, I couldn't see him at all. You know, DJ Shadow is on stage, but you cannot see what he's doing. And I thought that's a really good, like a brilliant solution. Because I remember standing there thinking, I wonder how he's doing this and thinking, oh, well, there's absolutely, I can't see him. So I'll just have to enjoy the music. All right. So I thought it was brilliant. And it was like, it highlights how, you know, if you can hide away, then you sort of sidestep the whole thing. But then you're still left with this idea of whether you, um, you know, you have a better time. But do you think like uh, changing position, how you perform uh, in front of the audience? Yeah, I thought about like turning, turning this round, like turn it round so you've got your back to the audience so they can see the system or mainly just having a GoPro and make, putting on your rider that you've got to be able to use a GoPro um, and you've got, they've got to stick it on a projector so that people, because I would want people to see this, you know, it's sort of just to understand and just to create the, the sort of narrative in people's minds. You know, they won't understand what these things are necessarily, but if they can see that your hands are moving and turning and you can see the lights blinking in time, you start to realize that what's happening is all in real time. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is like a good example of this is Orteca, who played in pitch darkness, you know, just turn off all the lights in the venue. They're, they're hidden up on stage with a laptop you know, perhaps some controllers, but no one can see what they're doing. You are forced to just listen to the music and they make the most incredible computer music that I've ever heard. Um, so, yes. Um, and so then, you know, I'm thinking about this whole can I play live with my modular thing? I'm enjoying the jams. And then I come across this guy, Stevio. Um, and Stevio is kind of an underground musician. He organizes this festival called Free Rotation. He's got, he's sort of active in this kind of underground scene in the UK. Um, but not very famous, really. Uh, but what Stevio does is he plays with a modular system. So he's using a large, primarily Dupfer system and just makes the most brilliant music. You know, his music sounds absolutely stevio. It is always exactly the same sort of, you know, vibe and theme. It's got this kind of somewhat jazzy, funky sort of um, feel, and it's the drums are really swung and kind of skippy and funky, and it's, it's amazing dance music, very sparse and minimal, but really, like, beautiful and, and sort of euphoric when you listen to it. I absolutely loved what he was doing, and, you know, I wouldn't say that necessarily I was into minimal house or minimal techno necessarily, but I love what he does. And so I'm watching this, and I'm like, well, you know, how much is this is pre-prepared? And then so he puts up a couple of videos explaining what he's doing and then I suddenly realized oh no it's all completely improvised and Stevie I learn is doing four five hour sets where he'll just play straight for five hours you know and I and then start reading forum comments and he's on Muff Wiggler and he's on like the lines forum and he's sort of very upfront and active and I started I've actually got a Google Doc with like every comment he's ever made that I've sort of <laughs> taken and pasted into a thing to try and consolidate an understanding of some of what he was doing um, because clearly whatever he was doing was was hugely successful uh, because it was funky and it was relentless in the sense that he clearly would would rarely have a bad show and and so it proved that no matter whether I could be successful doing a similar sort of idea, that it can be done. Um, so it can be done, is the point. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, as I've sort of developed it, I think, that, you know, there's a number of difficulties that you come into. And live music is hard. There's everything can go wrong, will go wrong. And I think as you design a system, one of the hardest things and the biggest lessons is don't give yourself too much to do, is accepting the fact that the just press play thing comes out of the fact that people, you know, they have albums to promote, they have to play a certain thing. And quite frankly, if you are being paid what some of these people are being paid to play, you can't afford to have a bad show because it could be your livelihood, which I completely get. You know, I don't, I have the luxury that I'm not, you know, I'm not a famous artist in that sense. And the things that I'm doing, really, it's for my own sort of interest. I'm really happy that other people are interested in this too and want to hear the music. But, you know, this is something that I just is an application that I was interested in. But the problem is, yeah, you've got to play and you've got to play certain things that people want to hear and you've got to be good. Um, and good means that perhaps you do have to have some kind of safety net. Um, 
So you know, designing a system, you just have to make sure that you've given yourself enough control without having too much to do. And if you watch what Stevio does, um, you know, he doesn't make fast changes and he's doing small little tweaks. It's the equivalent of just like a gentle little nudge on the sort of steering wheel of the ship. He's not making big fast changes. He's not doing big drops and rises and you know all this sort of stuff. Um, he has kind of settled into what the, what, what the modular is hard at or what modular makes it difficult to do are fast changes unless you have programmed a very clever sort of control system where maybe one knob can you know shift 18 parameters in different directions which could be done um, what I, I have come to embrace and what he definitely embraces is this idea is that one of the easier and more practical ways of playing is to establish a solid groove and just allow that groove to continue and I mean that's certainly true of making dance music you know your role there is to create a groove that the audience can get into and lock into and just don't don't just take that in and out that's very frustrating it's like giving a dog a bone and just sort of taking it and throw it you need the audience is there if they want to dance you've just got to give them a solid a solid train to get on um, and that also, the nice bit is that really suits how these things are to interact with because, I, you know, you, you just, I really struggle with the idea of making fast changes and making slow evolving changes is just a lot easier. Um, the risk, I suppose, is that, you know, your music can sound a bit samey in that sense, like the, the kinds of, you know, when you sort of put a case together and you start messing around, it's got a sound just in the same way that if you pick up a guitar, it's got a sound. You know, you, I think you have to embrace that and not try to, to reinvent the wheel in every instance. I mean, these modules are very powerful and they can go to different places. But I do think it does become necessary to accept that it sounds a certain way. Um, and certainly Stevio stuff it sounds so Stevio. There's, you can hear within a second, you know, it's him. But... I personally just, I love that music and that's fine. You know, I have no issue. And to be honest, I'm, whenever he's playing in town, I will, I'm just going to book the show and I will go and see him play because I want to hear that sort of thing being played. Um, but we do, we do just have this input problem that we've only got one pinching pair. So you just can't do a lot. I mean, I'm finding that having like these mixers with mutes is a huge factor, being able to just turn things in and, and you know, move things in and out very quickly. That's hugely helpful having mutes. Um, and I've used switch multiples in the past as mutes and routing. I would think that, you know, there's probably other ways, but definitely, I mean, a number of you have got these, but switch mute mults are a, a good solution. It allows you to make, you know, three or four or five reconnections or more just by flipping a load of switches. Um, that is a useful thing, but it, it get, I do think, you, know, you can see that I'm not, I don't have these plumbed in. I'm kind of trying to sort of get away with from that, I think, because um, unless you know the case very well, I mean, in Stevio's instance, he's been working with that system for more than nine years. Um, it, it just gets like a bit head scratchy when you're like, is this going here? Is that going there? Is that going there? And uh, it's not to say it can't be done, but I have found it difficult. And in a way, what I've embraced is just saying, well, hey, I've got that really interesting thing, which is flexible, patched into that one sound source. And there's enough for me to do to explore the different ways that I can gate that one sound source using that one thing, um, modulating it and the, source, the sound source in different ways, uh, rather than just doing all of this sort of mad like recalibration during a show. Um, it's not to say it can't be done, but again, it's just, I find it gives me uh, too much to think about. And then I, I'm in that instance when you're on stage, you're like, oh, fuck, I don't know what's going on, um, which is the worst thing. An interesting point, uh, talking again to Colin Vendors, is something that's been rammed home by coming here as well, is, is case practicalities as well. Um, it's tempting to get the biggest case you possibly can. But if you do start needing to travel with it, uh, the first time we've had a load of conversations about like, case handles like what the hell are designers thinking about when they put these handles on these cases you know have they ever tried to take their case to any train or like take it on any location because seriously man it's like yeah weight is an enormous factor um, and i do find it funny the whole like the wood we we're talking about this like wood cases yes it's cool yes they're tough but they're not tough enough to be taken on in the hold luggage do you know what i mean as in like I would, there's no case that I think I would be happy putting into the hold without a Peli case around it. 
Um, and I think that, you know, again, talking to Colin Benders, interestingly and tellingly, one of the things he said was one of his big innovations for URAC, his biggest dream was that people made lighter cases, you know, and that, that really, well, he had other answers, but lighter cases are important because if you want to go out and play, it's just a practical necess necessity that these things be portable, that they can close patched so you can develop something and really refine it. You're not having to repatch it on the day. Um, you know, which is, again, not to say that can't be done and that you can't embrace that as an aesthetic. But, you know, if you are trying to sort of find some holy nirvana in terms of how you've arranged things, then it is necessary that you can close it and keep your work and make changes, you know, as you go. Uh, but cases are heavy. Um, you know, that's the reality. And also they, they don't fit on airline carry-on regulations. It, it's a problem. So it's just something to, to kind of think about. Um, so... I suppose the question is like also thinking about do you have you know, how big is or how much do you need basically to play a show you know and I already said how I do feel that if you had just like an acid voice and a, a drum machine you can play a show basically it just depends on the gig um, I've been like booked to play it before and after like completely the wrong type of music and where you just like I'm not going to do well here because these people have just been listening to like Fat Boy Slim and now they're going to hear sort of strange sort of minimal techno and weird modular noises and it's like, um, it's an issue. But, you know, how much do you need? It, and I don't have a particularly good answer to that. Um, and what I have in this case, um, you know, again, talking to Colin Benders, he has four sort of voices um, because he's using the ER101 sequencer. So that gives him four outputs. Um, that he can change. I basically have three voices, I think, at the moment, um, comprised in uh, various different bits, which I can talk about. Um, but three was kind of like the magic number in a way. Um, I do feel that you kind of, there's some sort of markers to hit. For me, I've got kind of three voices, so it's like a couple of different sort of bass options that can play together and in harmony with each other, and a kind of sort of top line, something toppy. Um, it's really nice to have octave switching so that you can shift their registers around. Um, that's something that I can't quite do with all of these at the moment. Um, Platz has got octave shifting, um, as does the Dixie. This MDCO that I'm, I'm trialing doesn't, but um, the same company make Beast Chalkboard, which is a really nice octave switching. Uh, I'm a huge fan of just octave shifts. Just that, just it, right there is a really satisfying thing to do. And you can use precision adders to do um, octave shifts as well. Um, but yeah, do you have enough? Um, I've basically got three voices. I've got like three sort of four, four or five drum elements, some of which are from samplers, so they're flexible. I've got different sounds, but they, they sort of live in the world of kick, snarey like and hats. Um, and then I use the radio music as a kind of voice and texture. Um, I would like something more flexible. I'm seeing like the sound computer and morphogene and... I've got a space problem at the moment where you know you really have to try and make things fit. But something that was granular and could do interesting things would be nice. Um, you know, one of my I sort of had an early memory of Superboos, and yet again, Colin Bender's my current modular crush. Um, <laughs> seeing him play, um, he was playing with a Dupfer system. He just obviously, well, I asked him about this. He just went up to it and was just patching and just trying out a few things, and I, he just played the most brilliant. Like, I just stood and watched him for 10 solid minutes, and he was just always keeping things shifting and interesting and moving. And all he had was a bass line that he'd made, a kick drum, some kind of hat. And then there was, he used the A112 sampler, which is sort of kind of forgotten dirt for module, which is um, like a gritty sort of chip-based, like, 8-bit sampler. And he was just doing a kind of weird wavetable-y thing on that and just gating it differently. Um, and that, that was enough. So like weird sample, he called it like freaky noises, a bass line, and some drums. You know, freaky noises gives you just a bit of cover and it's about having enough stuff. For him, he said that, you know, he's got four elements. It always kind of means that even if he's changing one or two things, he's got two other elements just kind of plodding along in the background as you shift things. Um, because the worst thing you can do is hit mute and find that you've turned off that one element that you only just then realized was the real, like, heart of the piece. Um, and I think it's usually just bass and drums, in all honesty. As long as you've got your solid bass and drums, you can keep it moving. Um, it's just the other stuff. Um, so, yeah, three things, maybe, that's enough. Um, 
But I think you can just play a show with a 3 and a 909. So, um, yeah, what do we know? Uh, so um, maybe I can talk a bit about the system. Does anyone have any questions at all like at this point? Or I'll talk a bit about the, the thing. All right, we can talk about the thing. So talking about what I've, where I'm at with this, I mean, I've been producing videos on this for a while. Um, a number of you may be familiar with it, but I'm sort of constantly tweaking it. Um, you know, the, the side of it that, that is the most experimental is kind of drums. Um, trying to make that flexible has been um, a bit of an ongoing challenge, uh, but there's a few different things that I'm using. Um, the inherent principle, though, is using... Um, I basically, the way that I did this, by the way, is just to say I just prototyped it on my bigger system. It was lucky if you've got two modular systems, but just being able to like pull apart the big system and just try things where you've got all your modules, or kind of your whole library, as it were, and just go, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and, and do it by play testing rather than on modular grid, basically, by just actually testing it. Um, because I had this, there's somewhere there's a, a clip of uh, like SoundCloud thing, which is called like Techno Test 2 which was like 30 minutes, and it was just Metropolis, um, I think it was Trigger Riot, some drums, and a disting doing delay. Um, and the, for voice, I had the um, Intelligel Atlantis, and I was feeding the rings into its external input, which is a really nice pairing. Atlantis and rings, because then you've got, you know, if it was just this one voice, but one voice where you can start bringing in rings midway through a set, and you've suddenly got this completely different universe of sound, you know, that kind of physical modeling world, so it's very ear-catching if all you've been hearing is just like saw waves, you know, through an analog filter for all the time. Um, and it basically playing around with that or listening to that, and then what I did was wire up on my big system a version of that. But I just tried this thing, instead of using two sequences and combining them and like, you know, or, or using something like the ER301 where you can output four completely independent voltages, I thought, well, what if I just split the sequencer. And so what I've done is take the output of the sequencer here, the metropolis, and via like like a super collection of molts. Um, and by the way, these are the um, hoser multiples, which are really good if you want to stack to a ridiculous level. And especially if you want to stack within a small height, because if you're using stack cables like this, you see this? Uh, that's like that, if I try to close it, will we'll go push in my Pamela's workout panel. Um, whereas the hoser ones, whilst the actual jack is quite long, you, because the, the stacking point can be folded over, you can end up with like four or five different things, and you can literally tuck it down. It sounds like a stupid thing, but it means that I can practically send my sequencer to loads of destinations. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm sending the pitch output of the Metropolis to all of my oscillators. So to like the MDCO, Dixie, Platts, uh, to the Akemi's Tyco, um, and there's, is there another one? No, I think that's it. Um, so basically, but to these multiple voices. And so every oscillator is moving exactly at the same time with the sequencer. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm basically just sending different gate patterns to open their voices. So whilst they're being driven by the same voltages, they're not being heard at the same time. And that means that the voltage may have shifted down and changed so that you're getting a different sort of sound um, or a different pitch at the moment when they get gated. But also in terms of tuning, I've kind of tuned them all to sort of a non-specific, but a, just a kind of harmonious chord with one another. So that even if I don't have any pitch at the moment, you can see the Metropolis is, well now, the Metropolis is at zero and it's not being modulated. Even then, when you send a gate, you'll get a kind of the, the chord being played out like an arpeggio. Um, and we were talking about it before, you know, is there any rhyme or reason to the tuning? And there isn't, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, I, I think as we were saying before, it helps to kind of tune to Platts first, because Platts, I think, does um, quantize the input chromatically, I believe. Um, although you can use the tuning, I think, to offset it. I might have that wrong. Um, but I found it generally helpful to tune to Platts first and put it in a really basic sawtooth sort of voice so that it's not in chord mode or something like that, which is really hard to tune to. Is my favorite mode in the, the module. Um, and then sort of work off of that um, and then just tuning like the Dixie to the bass register and, you know, and you just build up a kind of a chord, for want of a better term, with everything wide open. Um, and then just close it all down and start playing, um, and, it, and it works. 
And I suppose then the question is just keeping it interesting. Um, and what I've done to do this is, is modify the sequence using another sequencer. Um, and so, you know, originally I was using two sequencers and a precision adder, which is just a, literally a way of adding their voltages together. So that, you know, whilst one sequencer can stair step, when a second sequencer comes in, you would get another shift on top mo on a momentary basis. So it would turn, you know, the two sequencers would work together to create a sort of hybrid sequence or a combination of the two things. And if you, especially if you have the sequences at different step lengths, like one is five and one is seven, then they're gonna phase against each other in a really sort of cool and interesting way. And I, you can do the exact same thing on a Metropolis uh, because the Metropolis has got AUX inputs. Um, so AUX B, I have in, actually it's an octave shifting mode, um, but I could put it on like P pre, uh, which is this one, which is like sort of um, uh, kind of semitone shifting, but semitone shifting before the output is quantized so that the whole thing is getting quantized to a scale. Um, and, you know, whatever shifts happen, everything will stay in scale, basically. Um, so I don't use kind of two sequences in that way, you know, uh, sorry, as in, you know, I'm not using multiple sequences and individually sequencing everything for every voice. I'm using a trick in order to simplify the process. Um, and I find it makes it very easy because you can, just by shifting the metropolis, it will change everything. So maybe I'll get some like, um, try and get it making some noise. So this is Platt through the Jove. So they're all getting this kind of bass. This is them at their sort of default bass pitch. So you hear how they're being picked out in different ways. And then I can use this other sequence to modify it by just turning up the little dial. So basically the, the sequences work together to kind of remix the music. And then you've got the kick. And I put the kick on its own channel and I think like the one thing I would definitely, definitely categorically like to have is, is side chaining. Like have a modular solution so that I can side chain the kick against the rest of the mix. And the reason for that is quite simply when you start getting very frantic in a venue and you're filling the speakers with sound, you just need the kick to come through. Because as we're saying, you know, with um, in terms of the developing rhythm and so forth, like you, as long as you have a 4-4, people are there to dance and the 4-4 is successful because it just, it gives a solid establishment. It's like the scaffolding on which you build your tune. Um, and it's one thing to say, ah, you know, I'm, I'm above 4-4 and you know, the, man, I do everything in, you know, 12-8 time and all this stuff. It's like, well, okay, but tr like from my experience of going clubbing and, and brilliant nights that I have had just dancing my head off, 4-4 four is like successful for a reason and it's like and from a perspective of trying to make our job easier trust me like if you've just got a solid groove it means you can be quite abstract with the rest of it and it, and it just binds everything together so like rhythm wise I have basically the other rhythm on this channel and, and then so if I start to use grids here we should start to hear things and I think the grids is just a, an absolutely brilliant solution it is a kind of a ready-made solution it is a cheat in the sense that it is prepared loops the grids uses a, a you know a sort of a map of, of the world's rhythms and by just turning the dial you can kind of get more rhythms or less and you can turn these dials to change the map you could use voltages to change the map as well but from a live perspective, from just like going, I just need lots of things to happen right now. Um, grids is amazing. That this is kind of one of those like macro controls, you know, and perhaps it would be wise to like set more of them up. Um, one of the things like starting to do, which is kind of in that vein, is that bass line that you hear, that bomb, bomb, is um, built using this abstract data um, event boss, which is basically a device that is like a, a bit like having a collaborator. The event boss, it, you can just put gates and sort of rhythms into it and it will improvise with different algorithms to choose what it does with them. Some of them it will divide and multiply, some of them it will just literally create different patterns, some of them it just is muting things in and, up, in and out. 
Um, but it works by sending it DC voltage offsets. And his other module, which is this mixer, can be calibrated round the back to either be a mixer or to be like a voltage offset generator. Um, so if I turn this dial, I get more or less. So it's just like that idea because give the alternative is I would use something with like a drum module with the buttons it's literally like frantically trying to do that it's just it just can't it can't be that difficult it has to be simpler and then one of the other things that I've done here is use um, um, a sequential switch which is something that I've seen Stevio use to great effect um, and what the sequential switch is is just um, it's a train station where you input your rhythm and there's a track switcher that has four different destinations and depending on where this the little button is switched it will send to those destinations the reason I started to kind of put it in was because I was recognizing that um, some advice uh, it was from Nick Bat actually from Sonic State who was like when you're playing stuff, you know, doing demos like this, try not to just play too fast, slow things down and play with more, like more sparsely, sparser riffs and melodies. They just, you can listen to them, listen to them for longer. And I was like, that is actually a very good point. Like the, obviously as the old sayings go, it's about the space between the notes um, and, and embracing a sparser sort of groove also gives you more time to reflect and do things. Um, and so the, I was trying to use the sequential switch as a way of having stuff that would happen kind of at the end of every bar or at the end of every two bars or even later. Um, so you can maybe just about see, but I actually don't have a thing plugged into input one. And on the dirt for one, you can choose whether you can even, even whether it reaches the higher steps, if that makes sense, the higher outputs, so that you can have things that you want to happen even less frequently. Um, it would be nice if there was a kind of randomizer or a sequencer aspect to this where you could you know, choose the order in which it would jump between. I'm sure there are probably more complex and more expensive sequential switches that do that. Um, but in this way, Sometimes it will go to a Kemi's castle, a Kemi's Tyco here, which is flexible and interesting and can be melodic. And I'm actually sending it the, the pitch. And then if I have it, so it goes to the other voltages or to the other output, sorry. Um, and there is a reset here that's being controlled by this Laddick divider. So I can make it go fast. You can see one of the other ones, other sounds is this tip top one. 909 ride, or the 909 open hat. And I can slow this down. And actually the reset is coming from this um, Laddick little sequence, a step sequencer here, which is also the thing that triggers the plats. So whenever I'm changing the plats, I'm also going to be changing the, the riff, the drums, I should say, in some way. So it's trying to like, you know, that comes out of the like necessity that I don't have that much stuff in this case, but it's nice to have things that um, which can work out a really nice interrelationship where just that one control does have multiple functions. Unfortunately, there aren't any like quick solutions to that and it comes out of testing to find the most musical application. You could only do that through practice. Um, but yeah, I think it's just one of the important things is to establish some kind of key shifting. I've seen other musicians play using the precision adder and the Arturia key step to just create uh, shifts on the keyboard, you know, just to, to octave shift the main melody and just create very nice, satisfying hands in the air sort of octave changes. I'm using this divider as well here. So if I slow this one down, you can maybe see this goes fast or slow. And then in this way, because you can also hold the button down and constrain the sequence to just four or less notes, then I can kind of create like chord, sort of chord changes, but like uh, key progression shiftings. I'm a, I'm a self-taught musician. Oh, sorry.
like this. Sounds quite good. Sounds like orbital. But yeah, so creating key shift is very easy in that way, uh, but you can use a precision adder. If you don't have like a complex sequencer like this, you do need to use a quantizer as well. That's the only catch. There's obviously quad quantizers, uh, the intuitive quantizer, the ornament and crime, as well as a great multi-channel quantizer. Um, but you really only need like one of the basic quantizers if you're doing what I'm doing here and splitting its output across multiple voices. Um, mm -mm -mm, uh, yep. Obviously, effects are important. I've got like two effects in here. Um, I've got the Rainmaker, um, which is wild and crazy. Uh, and I've got Herbverb, which is a sort of beautiful sounding, like algorithmic reverb. You know, a lot of you already have it. And I've got the Sends here. And I think a number of you are asking, like, you've got a really small case, why are you bothering with Rainmaker? Because it's just such a big module, and that's a very, very fair point. It is a really big module. Um, but I, I just justified it in the sense it's adding that much extra to my music. You can have these wild, like, complex, really long delays, which can be real rhythmic complements, you know. Um, and you can save presets so you can load them up, but just, you know, delay is such a critical element, you know, it can add wonderful, like, call and response aspects to what you're doing where, you know, especially if you're doing sparse dubby music where you've just got, you know, this one stab that comes every, you know, two bars and then it's got a beautiful, like, echo that happens in the back and the call and response, that can be enough sometimes just to keep a groove alive. Um, and this thing is wild and crazy and you can really, just make the nuttiest things. One of the fun things we were trying last night was basically changing it every step um, with a random voltage like this. For like Richard Devine sort of vibes. Sorry, Richard. But yeah, it's nuts. Also really quite enjoying using the um, pre-fader sends on the mixer as well. So you can just send elements in a really dubby way in the background just to have them, even just like 2% of something just echoed in the background is really nice just to build more beds. I'm still just learning, you know, the best way to use this system because it is, once you build it, then it's a question of learning what's it good at, what's the groove that you have to do with this and that's manageable to do. But yeah, I was just gonna sum up. I mean, it's like, basically having lots of modules doesn't necessarily make your job easier. It probably makes your job harder. Um, try and find the least amount of modules and the, the most elegant system that you can get away with to play because the reality is if you are inventing music in real time, it's not easy and you don't, having too much to do is the hardest thing because you'll get yourself in knots, you're doing complex things. You have to be able to keep a groove and not break it very easily. Um, and I've, as I said many times, I've just had the most fun with just a basic synth voice, some effects and a kick and some, maybe some other elements. It's like you don't need much. Um, and then when I'm actually sort of playing, it's just, uh, you know, to sum up, like people have asked, like, what's going through your mind? How do you think about a set? You know, and I, I don't have a particularly good answer to that other than, you know, you're mindful of where you're going, the type of event, who's going to be on before you, there's a kind of tempo you're going to play at because that very much can be changed and makes a massive difference playing too slow or too fast. Um, you know, I do think about things in terms of, you know, it, the hardest job is, is whilst you're busy making the music, being mindful, you've always got one ear and over the overarching mix, what has been going on too long? what needs to change. Um, and I think it can help you to have a little bit of random voltages that are slowly changing parameters to keep things alive. But I think what's valuable is that those voltages are not totally random, that there is a sort of rhythm, a cadence to them, because that leads them to be rhythmic 
and musically interesting. I think true randomness is not very exciting personally. I like semi randomness where it but it still sort of respects kind of groove theory and it will still be a musically appealing sort of variation that it is making. And then it's just kind of one thing that I've li literally written down before to remind myself is like seeking contrasts. If I've been doing loads of X certain thing, pull it back and do the opposite and then repeat the process and then pull it back and do the opposite. And by doing these sort of, you know, complex and simple, complex and simple, it's just not to just fill the sound spectrum like a big sausage um, and just keeping things on an even keel. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, but it's when you're actually in the moment and doing something and there's people watching you, it's easy to forget those things. Just trying to keep contrasts is just trying to keep it moving and evolving in a way that's slow and deliberate. Another thing that I've literally made a note of is move slowly, like don't just do this. Don't like, and cause, which again, when you're nervous on stage, is like tempting. Is slow the slow the hell down and just like make very slow and deliberate changes. Because I think the worst thing is just accidentally pulling out the one element, muting the one thing that was the most important part of your groove. Is like just slow down, give yourself time to think. I think you know you're. It's like when you do a talk and you speak too fast. It's like it's. It's different for you than it is for the audience, and perhaps the audience is more forgiving than you give them credit for, and then they're not bored. You know, that's the worst thing is that the audience is bored. You know, just just trust. They're here to see you. They're standing there. Then just slow down. Um, and then the final thing is practice makes perfect. Like that's also kind of an obvious saying, but you know. Modules are one thing. It's all very well to have the flashiest, greatest, possiblest thing and to have the most creative setup and do the wildest things. But nothing will make more of a difference than you being the true master of your system and knowing it. And that only comes from rinsing and practicing loads. Um, and another thing, uh, so one of many things I've stolen shamelessly from Stevio is a, his advice on like how to practice is basically if you're doing this, you're doing like a kind of improvised play for as long as you can show is replicate gig conditions and stand in front of your system and play as if you are in front of an audience and at no costs stop. You have to push forward as if you really are there to try and force yourself to get into a groove and learn how to just be fluid and continuous with your system. So you've got to, you've got to just go without stopping for two, maybe three hours. And don't just, just go on for five minutes and go, that's cool. And then it, you, you can only learn from replicating what you will truly do on stage. So you do have to kind of persevere. You will have shit moments and that's why you're doing it in private at home. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's how you'll, you'll really truly know and build confidence and be like, oh, I, I don't have to worry that I'm inventing music tonight because I've, you know, I know whenever I go in front of this machine, I can pick up the, the wave and roll with it. And I will always take it to interesting places, you know, with some exceptions where it falls apart, but that will happen. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, are there any questions or any? Oh yeah, Lucas. What kind of uh, procedure will you recommend? What kind of what, sorry? So like, there's a few now. That I've used the Dirt for one because it's just simple and affordable. And um, vpme.de make a really interesting one like called the 42 or something where um, it's actually got not just because on the Dirt for one, if you push the switches, it just does octave shift, which is really nice. It, it replicates the octave shifting functionality. But on his one, it, can, it, has, it has like funny semitone ratios, like four plus four and plus seven. And what is really nice about the precision adder is that you can do reductions. So you can shift things down, you can shift things up. So you can kind of almost do a little key shift just by flicking those switches. And with the VPME one, you can combine them and create different ratios and intervals. Um, but the Dirt for one is great. It's a precision adder, like all Dirt for stuff is great. Um, so I would just get that. Well, I have got a couple of those, they're good. The chalkboards, I like it a lot. And actually the other good thing about the chalkboard is you've got um, like buffered multiple outputs as well on those. So you get kind of two buffered outputs. Um, and I, I would like to put one in, into this case, like here, basically, so I can... I actually think the big 
guys are cool. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Life I like them. Well, but the, the, the Dirt 4 one is quite good. Like, the, on their oscillators, it's quite good, the little optic. Just because it's small, you can get your hands around it. Um, but, you know, uh, I've seen it Stevio's system. He literally has spaces in between, like, he has, like, so much space that he can spread everything out, put, which is obviously better um, because, you know, when you're, like, uh, trying to do something quick and allow muscle memory to take over, then ergonomics matter, but also so does respecting carry-on standards. <laughs> Yeah. Sound source you can go to just no, I don't. <laughs> I should. <laughs> we were talking about that. Like the good thing about the Stilson hammer is that you've got presets built in, or you've got preset rhythms, uh, uh, melodies, basically. Yeah, that would be great. Um, the Metropolis doesn't have that, so the short answer is no. I think the the solution is just don't is just move slowly and don't make fast changes because that's it, it's it's really you know it's something I've struggled with. Like making music is always like trying to get your head around what really is making this track work in the moment and it's just, just not taking that away <laughs> or modifying it too fast. So yeah, don't make fast changes unless you're really confident you know it's going to be good. The show I tried to do for, it was really small and it turned, I screwed up the clock somehow oh, yeah. and I just switched to the radio music and it happened to randomly be on somebody just talking. From oh, amazing. From Tom <laughs> oh, nice. And people thought it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really neat. I do, well, I do have radio music in here, so... So yeah, but then I don't, I'm doing it rhythmically. I need to have like, I have got some Carl Sagan in here that I can go to and just space everyone out, add loads of Rainmaker to it. Like, that's good. Do you, do you have a default state that you go to? I would just li literally zero it. It's zeroing the metropolis, zeroing the influence on the metropolis, mm -hmm. and then just, just dropping the, like, the, grid, uh, the grids down basically so it's just the you know the things that are generating the offsets are just all zero and the gates um obviously i'm using euclidean circles as well and it's basically just having it on a 4-4 is kind of my default really um and that's a great module as well i'm kind of only just starting to integrate it but um so yeah we were talking about i can maybe show it very quickly but can you see this like it literally you can just turn the dial And then by shifting the phase, you can sort of play around with elements. And then changing the length. It seems really fun, yeah, it's just really simple. Like it just, then it phases in interesting ways. And then that's, that's doing the triggers on radio music. What's that? So Radio Music is basically a sample playback module where you have a little SD card and it has all of your sounds on it and the sounds could be any length, they can be like an hour and a half long. And your like the theory is that you're, it's like someone created a radio station from all your samples and all your samples are different radio stations playing in the, the ether and that now you, what you do is you tune into your samples. So you literally change in, hang on. So I have this in it. Change the station. And then I've got different banks. This one is all like number stations. Another one. I'm running it through a filter, but it can do, yeah. And no, it doesn't have like, um, it can play quite high quality sounds. Um, but I've got quite a, these are all like off shortwave radios and I'm running it through the WASP filter as well. So that is part of it. But yeah. You can have on, so a station is just one sample and it could be, and it will loop. It could be like an hour and a half long. I have like the opening, cause this is really nice, check this. Yeah. Yeah, I want, like, that's just like a, it's an orchestral instrument. It's like a, is it a piccolo or something? It's John Williams' orchestra. But it's actually, that's an orchestral instrument. It's not an ARP 2500. 
Interestingly, I went, I went to a talk by David Friend, you know, from ARP, who developed it at, um, at Moogfest. Um, and he was basically saying, he was like, because obviously ARP got in touch, or Spielberg got in touch with ARP to do that whole thing. And obviously the person, that lad who was demonstrating the system was ARP's demonstrator. Um, but Steven Spielberg really liked the way he looked. And so he was like, do you want to come and be in the film? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he said, so they lent an ARP 2500, which is obviously incredibly expensive at the time, lent it to him. And um, he said that it was used for months. And when it came back, he said, have you ever seen a greasy synthesizer? He said, because the smoke that they used at the time was oil-based, it wasn't like this kind of the way that like um, dry ice is now. It's like oil-based smoke, which was wafting through the ARP 2500 for months of filming. He said the whole thing came back, it was like slick. And I, I said, I think it had to be destroyed. It was put, it was decommissioned because it was, it was ruined effectively by the filming of yeah. Close Encounters, which is like, not cool. Oh, there we go. With Rainmaker. Now see the everything else, everything else, everything else blank. Picking out, picking out, picking out. One there, one there, one there, one there, one there. Which is like then if there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. It's just like to have that like rhythmic interest. Oh shit, sorry. good like radio music is also like only 100 quid or something for a kit it's quite easy to build um yeah it'd be nice if it had like granular or stretching obviously but it wouldn't yeah it's cheap and affordable and cool when you get a module in your case and you don't feel like you're getting on with it how long do you try to force yourself to yeah it depends like because then you, i have that weird like fear that i'll just get into it in another context like Things that I don't use, I'll keep in the case. Like, for example, Metropolis, I wasn't using it for nearly a whole year. And now I'm like, oh, no, I'm really, I really have regretted selling that. You know, I don't want to sell. That's, that's just, it's always going to be inspiring and interesting. It just might suit a certain musical project. But, you know, I think it's, it's good not to be too precious about these things. You get your money back anyway, so just, just sell it. Sell it and get something else. You'll make do with less, and if you really need it, then you'll you'll buy it again and you won't have lost much money to start with. Do you have any system for your cabling? I mean, you've got lots of different kinds of colors. There's no, yeah, I did think about that. It would be nice, especially for this, just to like color code things so that it was, it was clear to when you're demonstrating it, but I don't really. Um, you know, I'm using like a combination. These are like the Archeria braided cables that came with like the BeatStep Pro and the KeyStep, which I think are really good cables. Um, just because they're, they're quite, they're such a silly thing, but because they, they don't have a very long head on them and they're braided, they're very flexible. So they're really malleable where you get big fat cables. Like the, um, these are the like newer versions of the stack cables that have got like a different material. They're really like bendy. Um, some of the older ones I've got are a bit stiffer um, and wouldn't curve. And that's a huge problem when they have to curve completely 90 degrees for this to close. Um, these are not as good, but there's no sort of system to it, unfortunately. Um, I normally prefer like cable tying them up so that you clear out the controls you need to get to so they're out of the way. Um, but I've kind of, because this is new, I, I think the problem is when you bunch cables, you make a real knot that, that can crush against things. Um, I've kind of accepted I'm probably going to have to minimize that for this case because it's so, there's only seven centimeters of space here. Once you add in a big cable spaghetti, it's, it's a bit scary. Cool, thanks very much. Thank Cheers.